thanks everybody uh, for being here. Um, I love caves because I love bats, and a lot of bats use caves. Um, does anybody know how many bats we have in Arizona? I'm sure you guys all know how many species of bats. I know, yeah, it's kind of a trick question. So we have, well, we always say we have 28, um, but like Debbie pointed out, that includes more moops, which, let's see, is this, got, no, that's cake, thanks, um, which is a really cool bat, but we, you know, we don't really have more moops here, they don't, uh, but, they were caught here in the in 1950s, and so we've kind of included them. Um, but anyway, Arizona is a really diverse, has a really great diversity of bat species, at least 28. And depending on how you count things, um, now we can include the eastern red bat, which some of you may have seen the paper, um, the publication that just came out just within the last month or two. Um, by uh, Jaluso and Valdez. Um, so they were examining red bat specimens housed in the um, Museum of Southwestern Biology at the U of, uh, University of New Mexico, um, as well as other specimens, and they noticed that there are actually several red bats that have been misidentified over the years um, and presumed to be western red bat based on the range um, but actually are um, eastern red bats. So in the 1950s as well, one of the uh, specimens was mis-ID'd as a western red for Arizona. So now we can include that one. And probably Nivalis is, um, I believe there are a couple of records of Nivalis, uh, uh, Leptonicterus Nivalis, one of the long-nosed bats. Um, in the southeastern part of the state. So we might be able to count, you know, 30 and then as Taxonomy is always kind of a, a fluid thing, you know, there's probably, it, it's still a give or take kind of thing. Um, but definitely a great place to study bats. So I'm just going to kind of talk, touch on some different things we've got going on here in Arizona over, you know, the past year and in the past few years and things that are coming up. Um, so in terms of roost monitoring activities, um, the department, and we have a contracts branch, and they go out and do um, a lot of abandoned mine surveys, and um, they've had contracts with BLM to put bat gates on, um, on habitats that either are good for bats, um, known to um, house bat colonies, or have that uh, potential. Um, and we do a fair bit of just annual roost monitoring. So for certain species of interest, like, you know, we uh, annually survey some of our mega uh, free tail bat colonies. Um, there's a really huge Mexican free tail bat colony, uh, maternity colony up in the near Kingman area um, that we go out and survey each year. Um, we try to keep tabs on our California leaf nose bats at some of the um, roost sites. Sometimes we don't survey them all, you know, every year, but at least every two to three years we try to get to some to these sites. Um, lesser long nose bat, which I'll talk a, a little bit more about um, as I go on. Uh, there's several sites that uh, we and many partners um, uh, survey each year. Uh, Myotis velifer um, is another species that um, is kind of um, with white nose syndrome becoming a species that we, you know, are looking a little bit more at um, regularly tracking their colonies. A lot of the myotis species we haven't necessarily done annual counts for, so we're looking at um, um, including some of those in our annual uh, counts. And then I have kind of a wish list. I would like to do more with, um, with UMOPs. Um, and track their colonies a little bit better, um, revisit some of the historic UMOPs uh, colony sites. Um, also Idionicterus, we haven't been out to our Idionicterus, uh, Allen Slap at Browd Bat sites um, for several years, so it'd be nice to kind of revisit those. Um, and um, Fringed Myotis as well, and that's something I'll talk a little bit more about in one of the other slides. So um, 
a few years back, we uh, worked with Bat Conservation International to do a big winter cave mine survey. Um, and BCI surveyed um, 128 different caves. I talked about this at the last cave symp uh, symposium when you all were here in 2017. Um, and that had just, um, you know, kind of wrapped up. Um, so they surveyed um, 128 sites. Um, of 128 caves that they went into, um, and with some of those were being were mines. Um, 21 found um, wintering bats, but we what we were finding is what we've found kind of throughout the West um, are sites with just our bats just seem to hibernate in really low numbers. And you know if you're ever out in a cave and see you know in the winter time, I don't know how much caving happens in the winter um, with this group versus, you know, I'm assuming summer is a more popular time to be out. But if you ever see um, bats, you know, uh, hibernating in the winter, I'd really like to know about it because, um, you know, for nothing else, it uh, gives us another point to kind of, you know, keep track of and just is an opportunity for us to you know, either learn more or to kind of confirm what we already seem to see, which is you see, you know, maybe half a dozen, maybe a dozen bats kind of tucked in these little cracks and crevices and caves, and uh, we don't really know where they go, whether they're in larger cracks and crevices and, you know, rocky mountainsides, um, or whether they go out of state. Um, you know, where do bats go um, in the wintertime? So, and then uh, over the last couple of years, we've focused a bit on uh, three caves that are up in the northern part of the state. Marianne's going to talk more about those. Um, but just to kind of, you know, do multiple surveys through the winter to see how much movement is there with these bats and, you know, which species of bats were there and, um, and you know, what's the situation of, uh, with, within the cave structure, where are they roosting, and, and things like that. So um, that's been a good, a good study we've been involved with. Um, so over the last year, also, I, um, I looked at our um, fringed and cave myotis, um, uh, our database, to look at the roost records for those species, and found uh, there were a good number of uh, and the reason for this is, again, because of white nose syndrome um, and with fringed myotis and just myotis in general being a, the, the genus that we're kind of most concerned about probably um, with regard to how that disease is going to play out. It's probably going to impact the myotis species. Um, so, and they're not a, um, a group of bats that we've really focused a lot on over the years. Um, there have been, you know, different studies on them. But, but in terms of going back to, like, where are they hibernating or, you know, where are their summer colonies and things like that, it's kind of hit or miss. So um, we examined the um, roost records for those species to see, um, you know, how many Thysonotes roosts do we even have and, and you know, how often have they been surveyed over the last 20 years, and prioritized um, those uh, uh, sites for future surveys. And so came up with a priority list of 10 Myotis Thysonotes sites that I believe are significant in need of, of survey. Um, a lot of, in a lot of cases to check whether they're still viable. In many cases, um, these sites had been reported to have between 100 and 300 uh, Thysonotes um, and hadn't been resurveyed in over 20 years. So my question is, is this site that you know, was reported to have 300 Thysonotes, did it really have 300 or was that potentially um, you know, a, a, a new biologist who didn't know what they were looking at or, or who knows? Um, so anyway, we want to get out uh, this summer and check some of those sites. And then the same thing with developer sites, which have been um, visited a little bit more frequently uh, through the years. Um, and so we want to get those kind of on a more regular basis because it's possible that with white nose, we won't see what they've seen in the east. So we won't necessarily see piles. I mean, I hope we don't see piles of dead bats. But then how are we going to detect it? Um, and, you know, is it going to be something about the maternity colonies that becomes uh, something that, you know, is more 
visible to us. Uh, one of the other things we have, um, uh, I have about six roost loggers. Um, so we've put those out at some of the velifer sites to see when do these bats arrive in the spring and when do they depart in the fall. So that's kind of a neat thing that this like simple little, so like a little pelican case kind of a deal and it simply records the acoustic calls as bats are coming in and out. And, uh, but you can really get some good information and here's some example graphs of that. Um, so if you know of sites, um, you know, that uh, especially with Velifer or some of the myotis, um, it might be kind of nice, especially if it's a site that's not really visited by people, to put one of these roost loggers out for a few months and, um, and we can get a sense of, of just the overall activity. And in, in particular, is there something about when they leave and is that the same each year, um, you know, it could be tied to some sort of phenology event or um, another event that we might not be able to make sense of now, but might be important in the future to have um, some of that data. Um, another thing that we're doing is getting more involved with acoustic monitoring. So acoustic monitoring uh, with the ability now to buy these acoustic detectors at a much lower cost. Acoustic monitoring is becoming something that a lot of states are doing across the U.S. Um, so we're involved with that as well. So there's NABAT, which is the North American Bat Monitoring Program, and that's an effort that is coordinated by the USGS um, to get states really involved with monitoring on a um, really systematic basis with these acoustic monitors as well as doing roost surveys and contributing that um, information as well so that we can start to actually get trend information about bats, which is a really difficult thing to get at. Um, we've also got acoustic monitors set up at uh, 10 of our wildlife areas throughout the state um, and a long-term acoustic monitoring project on the lower Colorado River that's been collecting data for at least probably 10 years. Um, so our plans are to expand our acoustic monitoring um, to help get at some of this trend information. Um, also, we want to be, um, we're in talks with the USGS and several other agencies to put together a Southwestern Bat Hub where there will be a coordinator um, to, to help fill in the gaps and get acoustic data in places that, um, you know, we haven't been able to get it from yet um, and to get field crews out to put acoustic detectors um, and uh, they've got a similar type of hub in the northwest and it's working really well so uh, New Mexico and Arizona have have um, have been speaking with uh, USGS about how we can you know fit something like that here for our states um, and the acoustic monitoring gives you the ability to document seasonal bat activity, um, you know, you can compare from one year to another um, how, uh, uh, you know, what species are in an area, when bats become active in the winter wintertime, uh, bats that just completely disappear during certain months of the winter, um, things like that, um, and really get a lot of information that you wouldn't be able to get um, through mist netting or any of the other ways we have to monitor bats. Um, and yeah, just basic bat activity patterns that's good. And so here's the, um, the NA bat website, um, and they've got a really great website and they're continuing to make improvements to it. And you can see, you can get a kind of idea there of how many different states and areas are involved. Uh, across the country, so a, a lot of people. The problem with acoustic data is there's just like so, when you collect acoustic data, you end up with these terabytes of information to analyze, and it's, um, it's you know, got its own challenges. Um, and, uh, but um, it is something that we can all do, and it is really improving what we know about bats. Um, so. It's a, it's a great program and I'm really encouraged to see so many different states taking part in it. And so for Arizona, our, you know, this is uh, what the top 50 cells would look like. Um, we've, we've done, uh, sampled a, approximately 25 cells and, and some different cells than, that are on here. Um, 
but the, the basically a, um, there's a grid overlaying the entire United States and anywhere within the state, you know, um, the, the grid cells are 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers and it's this random stratified um, um, draw for um, the, the cells that you um, select and survey. Um, so it gives you a, a nice, um, a, you know, a nice ability to survey in areas where you, that you just would never survey and would never um, uh, know anything about the, the bat populations in that area because we typically in the southwest miss net where water is and so um, acoustics gives us the ability to go beyond that. And then the Northwest Bat Hub, like I mentioned, um, is something that we're hoping to uh, uh, duplicate out here um, for our own needs. And so white nose syndrome. So probably everybody's, I, I'm assuming everybody's heard of white nose syndrome. It's been around for over 10 years now, about 13 years. Um, the bats in the yellow listed there. So there's 13 species currently affected by white nose syndrome, and that's the um, the definitions. If a bat, you know, is considered to be affected by white nose syndrome, that that means that a bat has showed clinical signs and has actually, you know, died, had um, you know wing damage and things like that. Um, there are also a list of species that are PD positive, and those are species where there have been no bat deaths. Um, bec because of, you know, the, the progression of the disease. Um, so, you know, uh, some of those are, some of those are hibernating species, but others are not, and so they are maybe just carriers of the fungus at this point. So the bats in yellow are the ones that, again, um, this is a slide that I used at the 2017 meeting, and these are the new, the species that have um, been affected by the disease since then. Uh, so quite a quite a big list there, and there's tons of information on whitenosesyndrome.org. So I um, encourage anybody who wants to know more about white nose to go there. Um, uh, at that same website, you can keep track of kind of how the disease is progressing to the west, and you probably can't see because I can't even see. Um, the a lot of the western states that are kind of in the um, the hotter colors there. Um, most of those little county blocks have little polka dots on them, which means that they're PD, um, uh, either PD positive or inconclusive. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're experiencing in the West is that bats are coming, you know, being swabbed and found to have the fungus. Um, of course, up in Washington, they've actually had white, you know, bats die of white nose syndrome and, and, um, and you may recall a few years back um, when the white, when the Washington um, finding happened, um, it was in a little brown bat, and you know it was like, wow, it was just such a such a jump. Um, you know, Washington being a port state, there's there's a chance that that bat was brought over in cargo, although it was a western um, little brown, it wasn't an eastern little brown. Uh, so it was certainly affecting the, the Western population at that point. Um, we just, you don't, don't know. I mean, it could have been brought over on someone's shoes. Um, it's, it's hard to say. But it's certainly, you know, we're getting these PD um, inconclusive sort of results now. And um, uh, about a month ago or so, you may have heard um, the Grand Canyon report of a PD inconclusive um, and that was from um, uh, misnetting surveillance that is just part of the routine surveillance that we're doing in the last uh, few years. Um, so they have, I think, three sites that they're um, doing misnetting at in the Grand Canyon, and at one of the sites um, they captured approximately 14-ish bats, and they captured two um, fringed myotis, uh, one of which is um, uh, the um, the one that came up as PD inconclusive. And so what that means is that um, the the CT value, the value when they um, did the analysis, was really high, which um, the higher it gets, the more <clears throat> um, problematic it, it, it is to, to feel confident that um, that it's, 
you know, a conclusive result. Um, not all labs agree at what level. Um, the number 40 um, is generally considered to be um, negative, and this particular bat was at 39.36. And so, um, but nevertheless, uh, the the lab that is um, that has been doing the a lot of the analysis and is you know getting some of these sort of really low level uh, PD fungus. Um, it's not that we don't trust that lab, and this may be a case where we're getting an early heads up, and we have an area to um, to really focus in on for this next year, and that is the plan is to um, to focus in to do you know additional surveillance there in the Grand Canyon. They're actually planning to do some um, double samples where they will send their samples to uh, you know two different labs for results. Um, I want to point out too, uh, Texas has been doing that, and Texas actually has, um, you know, come up with these inconclusive results uh, for the last few years. It's you know some sites are just coming up year after year with these like really low level. So I think my only caution is that we just really don't know what this means, and we have to just you know keep our eyes open and um, and our minds open in terms of what might. Um, what might happen with this disease in the West. And so the National Wildlife Health Center out of, the, out of USGS is the, um, the agency that's um, um, in charge of the, the, sur the surveillance for the country. Um, they provide up to 10 free kits to each state wildlife agency to then partner out with other partners. And so Karchner, um, we, uh, got the kit out to Karchner today, and um, and they probably provide additional kits to other states. And, and as you can see, this is an example of um, something that they're doing this year. Um, they've requested that we conduct surveillance according to kind of a modified sampling design. Um, and they're what they're trying to do that's supposed to represent the leading edge. And so theoretically, if all those areas were doing their surveillance, then um, I guess, you know, what would be the um, indication of PD or white nose within, within that leading edge? And I think it's more of a test of a model, you know, and, and trying to get better at doing disease surveillance. Um, so they introduced this. Uh, asked us kind of late in the game to, to do it this way. Um, and so some states are going to participate and others are not going to be able to do it. I think New Mexico is going to give it a really good shot um, and they're you know working really hard to partner with a lot of different um, agencies to get that done. Um, but then in Texas, I don't think uh, we were on a conference call the other day and I don't think they're going to be able to do it quite like um, you know, like the Wildlife Health Center is hoping. Um, and, and part of the problem, too, is that a lot of these cell sites don't necessarily have bat resources in them. And so um, that presents somewhat of a problem, too. You have to have either a cave or a, a spring netting site um, to, to sample. So in Arizona, here's a map of Arizona, and then the list of the, the various um, partner um, entities and locations for this year. So um, we've got Parashant and Pipe Springs up here in the north central part of the state, um, and then the Grand Canyon is going to do two or three um, sampling um, areas, Karchner Caverns, as I mentioned. Um, down in the southeast, um, Oregon Pipe will be a new new area that we're going to uh, do surveillance at. And again, um, you know, with what we were asked, we're trying to at least identify some different eco regions to sample in this year versus what we've done the last couple of years. So um, Oregon Pipe, um, also at Canyon de Chez, um, so that'll be good working with the Navajo and um, and the Park Service up there. Um, also going to try to identify an area on the Mogollon Rim. Um, Montezuma Well um, staff are planning to do a couple of sites. Um, and then there's uh, Chiricahua National Monument and Saguaro National Park. They have kits left over from last year um, that they weren't able to 
um, get all their samples done and going to do theirs um, as well. Okay, switching gears to the lesser long-nosed bat. So um, that was the endangered species up until um, 2018. It was listed endangered. Um, it's now been delisted. So I thought I'd say a few words about, about that. We now have no um, uh, recognized endangered species in the state. Um, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. <laughs> um, depends on, I guess, what kind of spin you want to do. But um, so there was a recovery plan for this species in 1997, and then through the 20-some years, there was a lot of monitoring and roost monitoring of, um, of multiple known roosts, the maternity roosts in the southwest and um, transitory roosts in the southeast. Um, there's also a hummingbird feeder monitoring network. So a lot of work has gone into tracking the species over the last 25 years and a lot of volunteers and, um, and dedicated people. Uh, a status review in 2016 found that um, you know it, the, the species seemed to be doing pretty well overall. And so long story short, by 2018, Fish and Wildlife Service held meetings and, and ultimately came to the conclusion that it could be delisted completely. Um, so, and that was in, in part due to the, um, the stability that the species seems to show both in the roost and then the bat itself seems to be, um, you know, a pretty uh, flexible species that's adaptable. Um, and a, some of the, uh, most of the threats had been seen to be resolved from the original finding. So the post-delisting monitoring components, which this post-delisting monitoring, Scott Richardson at the Fish and Wildlife Service has, has told me that um, that's supposed to be coming out within the next couple of months, I believe. Um, so there's several roost monitoring components to that. We're gonna continue to monitor the, the maternity roosts, of which there are only three maternity roosts in, in Arizona. And there's one just over the border in Mexico that we help um, to monitor. Um, and then a subset of the summer roosts that are in the southeast. Um, those will continue to be monitoring. There's also a forage monitoring component to this um, PDM um, that's going to attempt to look at phenology and when things are blooming and, and whether, you know, uh, whether that seems to be affecting, you know, the arrival or departure of bats. Um, and so it, you know, we'll see how, how, how well that works, but um, the phenology network um, is going to be involved with that and probably a lot of volunteers. And there's been a lot of agave, BCI has been doing a lot of agave planting down in the southeast too. And so there continues to be work um, done, you know, to, to help the species. And roost monitoring help, um, we're probably going to have a lesser long-nosed bat uh, meeting this year in the southern part of the state. And one of the things that Scott and I were talking about is just the need to have people. And I was thinking that maybe this is where the caving community can help because you know caves and you know good etiquette. Um, and, you know, we need people that are trustworthy, you know, that can go out to sites that know how to get to some of these sites because that can be pretty squirrely too. Um, because, you know, we have kind of a We've got a set of people like Debbie, you know, who have been just there, you know, every year uh, and multiple times, you know, counting at these sites. But, um, you know, you lose people uh, and um, we, we, we need to make sure that we have people trained and, and able to help with surveys, not just for this species, but for other species. Um, so if you're interested in helping with something like that, it'd be good to talk to you or send me an email. Real quickly, because I'm like talking a long time. <laughs> I'm looking at my, t and uh, so bat habitat for bridges. Um, a couple of years ago, we uh, did this major um, at the Ina Bridge in Tucson. There was a major habitat. They were building a new bridge. There's like 25,000 Mexican freetail bats that live in this um, in this bridge, and we were charged um, and there was certainly help, Sandy Wolf helped, um, there was also um, the, the guy that makes the um, bat habitat out of New Mexico, uh, Justin Stevenson, um, with this you know huge challenge of getting the bats out of that bridge. And of course, this happened in the winter time, so was that 
even though there's 25,000 there in the summer, there's about there's still about 5,000 in the winter time. And so, you know, sometimes you approach these things and you think, okay, there's going to be mostly gone, you know, so that's when we'll do it. And then you find out, wow, there's actually quite a few that just sort of stick around. And so, um, anyway, we the new habitat was built into the new bridge, um, and the bats some had to be physically moved over to the new bridge and basically told, hey, here's your new place, um, and kind of locked in place um, uh, while the old bridge bridge was demolished, but um, that um, all eventually worked out, and uh, I don't know what the numbers are now, but the bats are living in the new habitat. But this year, we're planning to buy $80,000 worth of bat habitat. There's actually a bridge in Gilbert that we're hoping it's going to be torn down, um, and we're really hoping to convince them that they need to, you know, there's probably about 25,000 bats in the in the Gilbert Bridge where it crosses the Salt River. And so we're gonna have this bat habitat on hand. So if you hear of a bridge project, um, I'm gonna be kind of shopping bat habitat that could be, you know, incorporated into others because of course the Gilbert Bridge is, um, is running slow. I mean, they're several years behind schedule, and so now I'm going to have $80,000 worth of bat habitat. But I'm just going to get it anyway and just hope everything all works out. So this is wind. This is nothing to do with caves, but I just thought, I, you know, I was going to talk really quickly about wind energy, and, um, and this is a really neat resource if you at, at all are interested in wind energy. Um, it's a, if you Google U.S. wind turbine database, that's the best way. But it shows all the wind turbines throughout the United States and, um, and the, the total number of megawatts there you can see by the size of the blobs. And which, you know, when you look at Arizona, we don't have too many blobs. And so that's a good thing in terms of bats and wind because a lot of wind turbines kill bats. Um, so we have, oh, my thumb always ends up on the wrong spot. So we don't have too many, but we have this one called Red Horse Wind, <clears throat> which is near Winslow. Has anybody seen those? Yeah, there's only 15 turbines, but this is actually one of the killingest wind sites and, and by megawatt. Um, and uh, so it's 15 turbines. It's been operational for about three years. Um, and the mean, so in the Southwest in general, the mean, uh, uh, the median bat fatality rate, based on some analysis in 2018, was 3.3 megawatts bats per megawatt per year, with a range of 0.1 to 36.9 bats per megawatt. So a huge range there. Um, at this site, the fatality estimate is 33.21. Um, and, oh, whoops, let me go back my note here because I had I couldn't remember these numbers too well um, and that was actually just one year that was this past year um, but in year two it was actually over 42 um, and and I guess year one it was even higher than that so I'm I'm really super concerned about about this um, so to this point you know we're just trying to meet with them and, and encourage them to do things like curtailment and um, I guess in July they were supposed to put some um, acoustic deterrence on some of their turbines, um, and, and all of the turbines are killing bats. Um, and so we'll wait and see kind of what the results of that is, but, um, but I really want them to do some curtailment or something because um, especially, so it's killing a lot of uh, Mexican freetail bats, um, and then hoary bats, which is kind of, you know, um, Mexican freetail bats, don't occur where a lot of the other wind farms are, so we don't have a lot of data on, you know, but it stands to reason that they would get killed a lot. Um, and they've got a little bit more of a buffer, you know, there's millions and millions of those. But when when in they hit UMOPs and lesser long-nosed bats and things like that, which this, which this one is, then I get really concerned because there's, you know, so much low, especially UMOPs, such lower numbers. Um, so anyway, just for those in the south and for those kind of keeping an eye on things. Um, uh, hopefully, when we talk to them next, they're going to be willing to do some, some good things. 
I wanted to give a shout out that um, the North American uh, Symposium for Bat Research is going to be held in Tempe um, later this year. Um, Arizona Game of Fish and ASU are the co-hosts. It's the 50th anniversary. They're going to have people there from who were attended the very first one, which the very first NASBER was in Tucson, Arizona, back in 1970. So it's there's a lot of hype. We're gonna have pre-conference tours to the Sonoran Desert Museum, and I have to talk, hopefully, about Karchner, and um, an ax throwing for our, um, uh, for the Spallanzani fundraising event. It should be a really fun, uh, fun meeting. So if you at all, uh, and I, I mean, I think having the virtual reality uh, deal there, you know, um, if Blaze is interested in doing that, um, it's a lot of, you know, bat geeks and caver geeks, and I mean, not the cavers are geeks, but you know, um, yeah. So it's a it's a fun meeting, and um, it's going to be in a great location. And then last is. The bat quarter comes out in February, February 3rd. There's going to be a quarter with a bat on the back, a Samoan fruit bat. Yeah, so I'm so we should all be super excited about that and get a quarter. And if you ever go caving and see, huh? Cool. Yeah. If you ever see bats when you're out, please submit um, observations. You can, you know, just remember bats at azgfd.gov. Email me directly. Um, I understand, you know, there's secrecy involved with certain places and things like that. We don't share, we don't share data. I, I, and nine times out of ten, I will never even go to that place. But we just like to know where things are, and you know, and and that's it. We we need to know what species are where so that we can keep an eye out for them and protect them. So, even if it's just the basic, I was here on this day and I saw some bats. You know, that's good enough. Um, and the more detail, of course, the better. And um, if there's a way I can facilitate by providing a data sheet or something like that, I'd be more than happy to do something like that. So, and that's all, but I'll answer questions. Question. Mm -hmm. so as far as like, uh, you know, I've heard that you know, birds and stuff, but as far as bats, is it just a mechanical if it hit it and it killed them? Or, um... I mean, we don't know exactly because you'd think that a bat could detect it and, you know, so there's a few theories. Um, sometimes I think it's just that, or, you know, one thing that's been found is that they're just close and they suffer this barotrauma, um, you know, just from the closeness to the spinning blade. It does hit them um, as well, yeah. And so they may be migrating. Um, I mean, hoary bats, that's the, a theory. There's also a theory that, um, you know, some of the tree bats, um, might be thinking that it's a place to go congregate. Bats are most certainly very curious creatures. They, you know, looking for roosts and things like that. They may be just flying to check it out. There's also the possibility that they're foraging, you know, for whatever reason, if they're actual bugs or if there's, you know, just something to check out for foraging. So it's kind of a combination. And that's why, like, an acoustic deterrent, even with that, I don't know that one size is going to fit all. And so, yeah. I have a question and a follow-up question related to the park. Because I mean, when farms ever been successfully shut down because of bat mortality, like someone has said, you just can't work operate here anymore because of the bats, or is it usually just like, well, it's not going to be here for years? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know about for bats. Um, Yeah, and a lot of times it is, and but birds a lot of times end up saving, you know. So of course they've got a. I mean, and this site has actually killed some ball, uh, some golden eagles, um, and so a lot of times it's that that then saves the bats because you absolutely, you know, you can't do that and over a certain threshold. Um, I do know that the Aubrey Valley, so near Grand Canyon um, uh, caverns. Um, they wanted to put wind turbines up on the, the cliffs there, and we really fought with them about that. Um, and I think it was largely due to they could see the controversy because of the number of bat species and, and birds that migrate through there, that it was just not going to work. And Arizona in general is not a really high wind site area. so. I mean, it, it could be much worse for us, you know, but still it's bad enough when a small number of turbines is killing that many bats.